So let's very quickly talk about body fluids. Now, if you have a look at an average male of about 70 kilograms and had a look at the water inside their body, the fluid inside their body, it would constitute about 65% of their body mass. Okay. Now, this percentage, this body fluid percentage, depends upon certain physiological characteristics. For example, females tend to have less body fluid percentage and individuals who are carrying far more fat on their body have less as well. Now this is because if you compare fat and muscle, fat carries a lot less water compared to muscle. So that's the reason why. Now if you look at infants, you'll find that they have a higher body fluid percentage, and if you look at the elderly, they have a lower. So it's very important to understand body fluid differences between individuals and what's supposed to be a normal body fluid percentage. Now, of this fluid, so basically water with some solutes mixed in, of this fluid, where is it actually sitting? And that's what we're going to focus this particular video on. So, there's two major compartments that body fluids sit within. Now, these compartments are called the intracellular compartment and the extracellular compartment. But first, let me show you where they're partitioned. So, first, if I were to draw some cells up, so one cell, two cell, three cells for example, and then I was to draw a blood vessel here, what you'll find is that you have fluid that sits within the cell, fluid that sits outside and between the cells, and fluid that sits within the blood vessels. So there's three different places for fluid to sit. Now, the fluid that sits within cells is called intracellular fluid. Makes sense. ICF. So let's write that down. ICF is intracellular fluid. And fluid that sits outside the cell is called extracellular fluid. So that means the fluid between the cells and fluid within the blood vessel. And ECF is extracellular fluid. Now, that means that extracellular fluid is broken into two sub-compartments. So, what you'll find is first of all, the fluid between the cells is called interstitial fluid. Okay, so fluid between the cells is called interstitial fluid. So let's label that. So fluid sitting between the cells is called interstitial fluid. And fluid that sits within a blood vessel is called blood plasma. So you can break this up into interstitial fluid and blood plasma. Now, why is this important? It's important because extracellular fluid meaning fluid within the interstitium between the cells and the blood plasma, they talk to each other. Now, how does this work? Well, you know that when it comes to blood vessels that a large artery will break into a smaller arteriole which will then branch into a capillary bed and at the capillary bed you'll find little holes. So capillaries are porous and these pores let this fluid and some solutes come in and out. So that means there's some holes here in this blood vessel and that allows for certain fluids and solutes to come out and also to come back in. Okay, So that means that whatever fluid is in the ECF, meaning in the interstitium, is going to be easily exchangeable with the fluid in the blood plasma. Okay, Now again why is this important? Well because whatever concentration of stuff or solutes is sitting here between the cells is going to be the same concentration of solutes in your blood plasma. Exceptions include red blood cells, white blood cells, and some proteins. Okay? These are too large usually to go out 
or in to these blood vessels. Okay, but what does get exchanged here? Well, very importantly, the substances or solutes that gets exchanged between the interstitium and the blood plasma include all the different ions of the body. Okay, so what I want to do is list or label the important ions of the extracellular fluid and then label the important ions of the intracellular fluid. Okay, so ions of the extracellular fluid, well, they include sodium, calcium, chloride, and bicarbonate. So these are some of the major extracellular cations, positive charged ions, and anions, negative charged ions. So what are the most common or most abundant intracellular cations and anions? Well, let's just get rid of that. Well, the most abundant intracellular cation is potassium, okay? There's also magnesium. For the anions, there's phosphate and there's negatively charged proteins. Okay, so what you can see is two most abundant extracellular cations, meaning the two most abundant positively charged ions that sit outside the cell is sodium and calcium. The two most abundant intracellular cations is potassium, magnesium. The two most abundant extracellular anions, chloride, bicarbonate, and the two most abundant intracellular anions is phosphate and proteins. Now, remember that this partition is important because they're not easily exchangeable. Why? Because all cells are surrounded by a phospholipid bilayer. That means a fatty layer. This fatty layer, remember, does not like charged substances. Ions, by definition, are charged, which means they get repelled. So the potassium inside cannot just diffuse out, it bounces off the walls and remains inside. The sodium that's outside cannot just diffuse in, it will bounce off the walls and stay outside. They need certain channels to let them through. So that means that the concentration of sodium outside will not be reflected by the concentration of sodium inside, and the concentration of potassium inside will not be reflected by the concentration outside. However, because the blood plasma or the blood vessel does allow for exchange between the interstitium and the blood plasma. That means that whatever concentration of sodium is in the interstitium, that will be the concentration of sodium in the blood vessel. So for example, if I were to just extend this blood vessel out, the concentration of sodium outside the cell is going to be the same concentration of sodium in the blood vessel. The concentration of Calcium outside the cell is going to be the same concentration of calcium in the blood vessel, and same with chloride and bicarbonate. The clinical significance of this is when you test a patient's blood serum for electrolytes, for example, you take it from their blood, okay? So you draw it out of here, and what is it measuring? Well, it's going to tell you sodium concentration of calcium and chloride and bicarbonate and so forth and potassium. And you may think, but potassium's in the cell. Well, yes, but there is some potassium outside. And it's going to be a reflection when you take this blood and measure. It's going to be a reflection of what's happening between the cells as well. Whatever the concentration is here is the concentration here. Now, again, this is important because... Even though these ions are not exchangeable, so I'm going to now wipe this off and redraw it. So let's just focus on sodium and potassium. So even though this sodium cannot get inside the cell, and this potassium cannot go outside the cell, what can actually be transferred between the two is water, okay? Now remember, if diffusion cannot occur, osmosis will if there's a concentration gradient either side, okay? So think about it. If a patient had altered electrolytes, okay? Now, 
Firstly, it's important for you to be aware that overall, remember I said you've got sodium, you've got calcium, you've got bicarbonate, and you've got chloride. And I said inside the cell you've got, what was it, potassium, magnesium, phosphate, and negatively charged proteins. Well, did you know that the concentration of all these solids inside the cell should match the concentration of the solids outside the cell? And the concentration is, oh, dropping stuff, 290, you need to remember this number, 290 milliosmoles. Now that just means basically the concentration of solutes in one litre of fluid. That's what that means. And it's 290 milliosmoles. That's outside the cell. And that's inside the cell as well. Now, let me very quickly tell you how we got to this calculation. You will not need to know this for the exam, but how do we get to 290? Well, one of the calculations we can use is this. You can do, so, you can calculate the osmolarity, osmolarity, by taking two times the concentration of sodium, plus two times the concentration of potassium, plus the glucose concentration, plus the urea concentration. This will give you 290 in a normal individual milliosmoles. So for example, two times, now what should be the normal concentration of sodium in the blood? Around about 135 millimoles per litre. What should be the concentration of potassium in the blood? Well, about five millimoles per litre. What should be the concentration of glucose in the blood? Around about 5 millimoles per litre. And what about urea? Well, that's also around about 5 millimoles per litre. Well, what happens when you add this up? 2 times 135 is 270. Plus 2 times 5 is 10. Plus 5. Plus 5. What do we get? 270 plus 10 is 280. Plus another 10. 290 milliosmoles. So that means, so when, when could this change? Well, if I increase the amount of sodium, if I increase the amount of potassium, or glucose, or urea. Remember, these are just substances or solutes dissolved in the fluid. So we can change this concentration right here by changing the concentration of these solutes. Okay, now, in the next video, I'm going to talk about what happens in the body when this concentration changes. So for example, I'm going to prep the next video by telling you, let's just say that you haven't drunk water for about 12 hours. What do you think happens? When you don't drink water for 12 hours, that means that your body uses water up, right? It's going to excrete it in your urine and in your fecal matter and while you breathe and so forth. And it's going to use it to make energy, okay? Which means the fluid in your body, particularly the fluid in your extracellular fluid, drops. But what about the solutes? Well, in actual fact, your solutes will remain around about the same. It's just that the water level drops. So if you were to, I always think of it as though it's in a bucket. And here we've got all the solutes inside of this water. And this is normal. So you're not thirsty, you're hydrated. This is how you want to be. Perfect. But let's just say you start to become dehydrated and you're not drinking any water. Well, the fluid drops, but the solutes stay the same. So what happens? Well, the fluid level drops, but now you've got the same amount of solutes. What happens to the concentration of that fluid? Well, firstly, it's not very good, but the concentration goes up. So that means 290 milliosmoles may move its way up to 320 milliosmoles, for example. Now look at that. If you have 320 milliosmoles concentration outside the cell compared to 290 inside the cell, there's a concentration difference. 
And you know that when there's a concentration difference, things want to balance themselves out. And you think that sodium will want to diffuse in and calcium will want to diffuse in. And they do, but they can't because of the plasma membrane. So what happens? Water will try and balance it out. And just remember, water will go wherever there's a higher concentration of solutes. Where's the higher concentration of solutes? Outside the cell. So that means water from inside the cell moves out. What do you think that means to the cell? It shrinks. Remember I told you last semester that when a cell shrinks it's called crenation. Okay? Now I'm going to tell you in the next video how our body responds to this scenario.